In a way, there's a strange anomaly in the concept of climate security because we're used to thinking about the climate in terms of economic development, in terms of uh, environmental protection, in terms of bios the, the biosphere. Um, whereas security as a field, as you all know, as security professionals in one way or another, is a completely different field in many ways. One where you have an adversary, at least in many cases, and um, where extraordinary measures and ex extreme measures are permitted because security, the nature of security as a, as a political problem um, is of that nature. So what does pursuing climate security really mean? I'm going to try and explore that with you. Um, so how do I, here we go. So first of all, Um, it's, it's not many months ago, I'd say, since climate security was actually quite a marginal interest. Maybe not for some of you, but in the general mainstream discourse about climate change, climate security was not the top of the agenda. I think that has changed radically, and maybe the election of Joe Biden is part of that. So, but I'm going to quote um, something from the Dutch Institute for Planetary Security Initiative. Um, which puts the, uh, the conundrum quite clearly. I think climate change is a new enemy. It has no flag, no leader, no competence, nor a revolutionary manifesto, but it is a killer of people. It is operating worldwide to destabilize societies and it is gaining strength. You see here a clear framing of climate as a security problem. We've seen, uh, Joe Biden, one of his first uh, executive um, actions was to order a, a 17 um, uh, intelligence agency wide review of the, the national security threat emanating from climate change. So all of the intelligence agencies are now being charged with working through what climate security actually means and making an assessment of that. And John Kerry, the new US climate envoy who will sit as the first for the first time they, he, he in that position will sit on the National Security Council, I believe. Um, so you have a sort of securitization of the climate and the climate challenge, which is quite striking. But what does it actually mean? If there is no enemy, if it has no flag, if there it has no leader, if it has no competence, if it doesn't have a revolutionary manifesto, what does it actually mean to win? climate security as a, as a security problem. Well, last week in New York, this just underscores uh, the point in one way. Last week in New York, of course, it was on the Security Council's agenda. Um, and it's not the first time, it happened, I think, first, for the first time in 2007. But there, however, there were debates and certain members and permanent members of the Security Council objected to it being there, of course. Boris Johnson was not one of those objecting. But this, just, this is just taken directly from his speech, as an excerpt from his speech last week, and it picks out some of the ways in which the idea of security is translated, sorry, the idea of climate change as a problem is translated into a security problem. And this is the way that the political sphere um, speaks about it. This is what I'm interested in here. Uh, so I'm just picking out certain of the phrases here. I don't need to read this whole thing, but he talks about a young man forced onto the road when his home becomes a desert and when people are displaced. So migration, climate driven migration is an incredibly strong meme in this whole climate security discourse. He goes to some camp, he becomes prey for violent extremists. Okay, so we have climate change generating uh, violent extremism according to this political discourse, radicalization. And then the girl, this is perhaps the victim uh, narrative she becomes, she, she, because of climate change and the daily search for water, gets into the clutches of human traffickers, international criminal gangs. So we have a sort of merging of climate, firstly with terrorism, secondly with international organized crime, um, human trafficking. And then the third person he evokes is a farmer who's lost his harvest after droughts and then switches to poppies. So you have a kind of war on drugs uh, meme coming into this climate security discourse as well. And then you have the idea of impoverished and 
fra fragile nation, so the failed states idea, and the idea of shock waves of instability emanating from climate change as well. And he rounds off that passage by saying, now, if that kind of result in terms of political, economic, humanitarian impact, if that was triggered by some kind of despotic warlord or civil war, then nobody would question the right and the duty of this UN Security Council to act. Now, that's a big if. Um, but but uh, this is the way that climate is being funneled into the security sphere. A lot of these um, are actually empirically quite dubious. So there isn't a, a consensus on the established relationship between climatic changes and levels of conflict. But that's, that's a whole other debate, which I won't have time to go into here. But the, so what I'm talking about is at the political level, how climate becomes a security issue and of course how the political system interprets the climate problem will define what it means to win or to lose of course there is no uh, objective sense of winning against the climate uh, in many ways that goes for some of the things professor Heuser said as well that, that the the purpose of the war in itself is a political question beyond the military one as well so i'm going to disentangle all these ideas and give you four ideal types for what climate security means, dividing them up according to what is it that's actually threatened and what is it that's doing the threatening. So type one is the, the closest, I guess, to, to this community of practice, which is the idea that climate change threatens national security. It's what is threatened in climate security is national, in the critical national interests. So there's no basic change in that. It's just translating the uh, national security ideas and adding climate to it. So what is threatened is perhaps military assets that can't operate under extreme weather conditions, capabilities, um, dealing with new types of proliferating threats as Boris Johnson's speech elaborates. The idea of, of who is doing this is, is very much linked to the idea of climate-driven migration and causal chains or narratives about causal change that this leads to terrorism destabilization but also the direct threat of extreme weather. Um, type two is also alluded to in Boris Johnson's speech, but it's a different kind of argument. The argument here is that what is threatened is actually international peace and stability. So it's a question of order. Um, and here are lots of um, theories about how climate change will create scarcity, for example, will disrupt borders, and the idea that scarcity drives climate is, of course, controversial. Some people think it's abundance of resources that really drives conflict. But this is a sort of neo-Malthusian um, meme which is built into this discourse as well. So the idea that what is threatened by the climate change in terms of security is international peace and security. And there, the military's role is rather one of stabilization um, as opposed to uh, defense. Of course, these two will always be related. In fact, all of them will be. Type three, to move on to that one, has um, climate security as being basically a version of human security, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, the doctrine, a doctrine of, of security, which tries to reframe security um, practices as being fundamentally uh, um, a question not about defending sovereign states, but about, in the end, securing human lives, human rights. Sometimes it's, it's formulated in a very liberal sense in terms of securing human rights, or in a broader one about human welfare. So poverty reduction would be a kind of human security in this discourse normally. But in terms of, of that idea of climate security, climate is a security problem because it's threatening human lives, rights, welfare of individuals, but also of communities. And here it's, the, it's, the, it's more directly a question of floods, famines, droughts, et cetera, all the expected increased uh, extreme weather that goes with climate change. And the ensuing food security and um, basic habitat security that comes out of that. Now some very different uh, roles for militaries here about protecting human rights, about promoting welfare, protecting economies, uh, perhaps international aid, um, delivering emergency supplies, etc. The fourth type is um, spelt wrong, I can see, but you can 
imagine what I'm trying to say, ecological security is um, this version of climate security is perhaps what you find in the original scientific earth systems science about critical ecosystems that what is existentially threatened is the functioning of the earth system itself, the biosphere. Um, of course, that's perhaps also what's on the minds of certain NGOs or social movements um, beyond the scientists, um, but also certain governments and, and uh, indigenous uh, populations who identify in a different way with the natural world around them. Um, and there, the thing that is threatened is, is the biodiversity uh, or, the, or other critical boundaries that are associated with the ecosystems. And um, what is doing the threatening is the, again, the greenhouse gases, which surprisingly arrive very late in this debate about climate security, but also land grabs, which might come out of some of the measures designed to deal with climate change. So, for example, if we end up trying to use natural solutions to capture gigatons of carbon and store it uh, through for afforestation or changes in, in uh, land use, that's going to require wholesale and massive redistribution of land and use and ownership as well. So um, all four of these will exist in a, usually in political discourse in a mixture. Um, these are just separated out to give a sort of a clearer picture of, of what's going on and how many different versions of climate security are out there. And then of course, how many different versions of winning you can extrapolate from those at least four, but you, could, you can add them in various ways. So I would hazard that, I would suggest that, that the debate about the role of the military and climate change, as I've come across it at least, is fairly familiar with types one, two, and three. The idea that um, militaries need to adapt their equipment, their facilities, but also um, the range of activities that they need to be able to do to manage uh, security, national security and international security in a climate, climate altered world. Um, maintaining security in a reconfigured environment. So um, opening up new uh, theaters, for example, the ice-free Arctic is, is an obvious one, which is often discussed. Um, but also um, delivering humanitarian assistance after extreme events. So we've got the sort of human security element there. Peacekeeping interventions in, in, in circumstances of displacement and social disruption. Again, that's probably the international security discourse that that draws on. Now, um, the fourth one is more tricky. How might militaries have a role in ecological climate security. In other words, is there a role for the military in protecting the earth systems themselves? Or is it only the effects on societies and on the international system that lend themselves to a notion of climate security? Is it really an, an in, sort of inappropriate notion to bring security together with the idea of ecology? You could argue that as a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, um, relatively, I suppose, um, decarbonizing militaries as part of a sort of broad uh, proliferation of net zero targets, uh, most of them by mid-century, most of the world's economy is now under at least a political declaration to achieve net zero um, by the middle of this century. Um, let me just be aware that there might be chats that I'm missing. Um, so, sorry. So, um, um, how are militaries going to be able to honor that? And will they, as major users of fossil fuels, be hamstrung? If, that, if those targets are really taken seriously. The net zero concept implies that you can compensate for carbon emissions with negative emissions. 
But in the absence of a large scale um, net zero technologies, we're looking at net zero basically meaning real zero. Um, and this is uh, this graph here on the right is taken from a report about um, actually from the, from the US Department of Energy that, that uh, shows the relationship between different the uh, US Department of Defense in dark blue and the rest of the US government's uh, use of fossil fuels. Um, and it's obviously the big one, which is most dependent on the fossil economy. So is there a role in decarbonizing or is there a threat to military capabilities if decarbonization is really taken seriously? Is there a role in enforcing climate agreements? I mean, we get used, we've gotten used to the idea that environmental politics is low politics, security politics is high politics. Um, low politics would not necessarily normally be associated with military action, with extraordinary measures, but high politics is. So what happens when the low politics issue of climate becomes high politics, climate security? Will there be, this is purely speculative, obviously, um, will there be a, a climate role for the military in terms of dealing with international tensions that that are due to decarbonization, so not necessarily the direct implications of climate change, but the, the measures taken to tackle it, uh, e.g. if trade, uh, if climate um, and carbon issues become stipulated parts of trade regimes or trade wars, um, or if major adaptation um, infrastructure creates geopolitical tensions. And finally, which is my area of research at the moment where I don't know the answers to this, but the direct interventions in climate that are now being looked at, given the uh, climate security discourse that has arrived, what will the role of militaries be in that sphere, if at all? Um, now, first, I'm just going to quickly say something. How much time do I have? Something about what these uh, climate interventions or geoengineering are. Um, large scale intentional intervention in earth systems typically for the purpose of altering the climate so you may not have heard about these particularly you may have heard about them um i can these are some of the reasons why they might be considered but given the time i think i'm just going to give you a flavor for some of the technologies that are currently being imagined i'm calling them imaginaries because they don't actually exist but they are they feature in climate models and they've if, future as scientific uh, explorations and theories. Um, so ice restoration technologies to try to shore up or uh, re-establish ice cover to prevent uh, positive feedback loops in terms of global heating. Various technologies being looked at there, including silicate um, uh, balls being spread across oceans. Um, the big one actually is the one on the right here, stratospheric aerosols, probably the leading solar geoengineering imaginary at the moment, which envisions the injection of sulfates or another aerosol into the lower stratosphere to try to filter out a small percentage of incoming sunlight or sun energy to thereby artificially cool the planet. Um, this is being examined, one of the first outdoor experiments is about to happen in Sweden. Uh, the delivery mechanisms to get things into the lower stratosphere are still to be worked out. One idea is this, that modified military aircraft would be the best suited to flying up uh, to deliver um, millions of tons of sulfur per year. Other, other suggestions have, have included giant tethered balloons that uh, have 20 meter, no, 20 kilometer long uh, feed tubes, tubes, feed pipes that dangle down from these balloons and from through which uh, a slurry of some kind is pumped up and ejected into the stratosphere. Um, it sounds very science fiction, but this is actually increasingly uh, being taken seriously in climate policy circles. Marine cloud brightening is another one where uh, seawater is used is, is being envisaged as something that can be used to spray up particles and change the colors of the clouds, changing the albedo or the reflectivity of, of the Earth. Space mirrors used to be a popular theory, but has, has disappeared slightly off the radar due to cost and feasibility concerns.
And with that, oh, go ahead. With that, with that, my conclusion is is uh, that I'm offering is that climate security is is the future, is the present, but it can mean a lot of different things, and uh, that not everything you hear about climate conflict should be taken at, at face value, um, but that there may be surprises ahead, as uh, our last speaker emphasised concerning military climatary security and expanded demands on militaries. Um, my questions, which I would love to hear uh, other experts answer, is what tactical strategic value or implications some of these technologies might have. But I guess that would be something for discussion in coffee groups, uh, in coffee rooms, or perhaps in the discussion time afterwards. Okay.